Welcome to GM Tips. GM Rick here. I'm going to continue. This is part three. This is a little bit separate, but I'm doing another one on the aquatic races and aquatic life of these races. So, including gods and goddesses. I wanted to make sure I hit everything because I, I really and truly feel like to do a campaign right in an underwater campaign, you've got to consider a lot of things. So, I'm going to do something I normally don't do. We're going to start with the D&D side. So for my D&D five years, um, this is for you. And also for those who are anything but the Pathfinder system. I want to give you guys some things that you can use no matter the system you work with. So let's look at the races. The races that are listed out in 5e and even 3.5 are these races. Aquatic goblins and kobolds. Yes, they have swimming goblins and kobolds web fingers and all. So they do have those, and those options are there if you want to play one of the small races, which could be kind of fun and chaotic at the same time. Uh, Scrags, so the aquatic trolls we talked about. The bullywugs, I forgot the bullywug. How could I ever forget the bullywug? And that can be used for Pathfinder or DD, by the way, as can Scrags. Um, the, and, and forgive me, I'm going to try to pronounce this correctly, Caecilius. The Caecilius are the merfolk that I talked about with the octopoid bottoms. They're merfolk kind of aquatic, or merfolk on the top, tentacles on the bottom. So, half and half. But the Caecilius, now they tend to be a little bit evil. They're not, or neutral at least, at best. They're not a good race. I'll just tell you that. The Grindylows. The Grindylows are nasty. They're like a goblin on top and an octopus on the bottom. Nasty little creatures. Now, in Pathfinder, the Grindylows look different. The Grindylows in Pathfinder look like almost like a sharkoid head with a goblin body, and then the tentacles at the bottom. So that's Grindylow. Uh, sometimes they actually have web feet too. Um, merfolk. So the merfolk are available in both campaign settings and most settings. You know, you can go into most systems and merfolk are available. So are Shahagan. Shahagan are the nasty, shark teeth, really just meaner than snot aquatic races that attack um, aquatic elves. They have a hatred for aquatic elves. They're like the orcs of the undersea. Um, so they're really raiders, annihilators, nasty, and very, very, um, <laughs> not, they're not herbivores. They are definitely carnivores of all sorts. Um, the scum. The scum are kind of in between. The scum are like a, almost a fish type of humanoid um, thing. They're small. Like, well, actually, the scum are bigger than Grindylows. Grindylows are smaller. They're more like the goblin size. Um, you got were sharks and marrows. Marrows are the aquatic ogres. Uh, and then the kuatoa. How can we ever forget the kuatoa? So that rounds out the D&D &D side of what I call playable aquatic races. There are other things. They do have aboleths. They do have nixies. They have pixies. Or not nix, pixies. Nixies are pixies or water pixies. Um, nymphs. They do have nymphs available. There is a water elemental race. Um, God, I forget what you guys call the elementals. We call them undines in Pathfinder, but they're like undines. Dines. They're the water-based, blue skin, um, very, and they they have an affinity for breathing water most times. So those are your races that you can play in 5e, 3.5, uh, 4, and pretty much are universal to whatever ones. So if you want to play Eberron, if you want to play Faerun, if you want to play Ghost Walk, if you want to play. Um, uh, Greyhawk settings, all of those are available. Um, Matt Mercer's coming out with his own setting for you guys who are critters, so he'll have his versions of what's available there. I can't tell you right now until uh, Green Ronin comes out with that. So until it comes out and I can get a copy, don't know, up in the air. But there's a lot of water races available for you to adventure with, and of course all the standard races. Um, but those give you some more of the water races. Why is that important? Because as a GM, you especially have to decide whether you want to let your players play them, number one. And then number two, these are the races they're going to encounter that are, <laughs> I use the term very, very loosely, civilized. 
They're more the raised up races that are enlightened out there. Now, mind you, the Aboleths are the nasties of the nasties. They are on both settings, Pathfinder and d and and even into other settings like Dungeon World. You go across the board. The Aboleth is pretty universal, despite whether you play a modern, a future, or a past. They are an alien fish type of race with multiple eyes, and they have mental abilities to dominate and control that just honestly blow away a lot of your mind flayers, um, lipids. And so they are a nasty lot and often use people as puppets to do their little biddings and schemes. And they live in the darkest depths. Um, in our world in Pathfinder, they live in Orc. In yours, they live in the deepest parts of the Underdark. They come up the waterways and they also live in the deep oceans. So those are things you can encounter at the really deep depths that have no real limitation as to where they can go depth-wise. They can go to the top surface, no problem. And they often are, are of spellcaster types, so they can cast some pretty nasty malevolent spells when it comes to this. And the big thing about them is most abolites don't get along with each other. They might live in small groups and factions and have some cities, but they're not like the Drow and the, uh, and the Dwergar. They don't like each other. And there's a lot of machinations that go on and splits and cults. Now, they hate the humanoid races and use them as slaves. There are probably could be an iteration where one was good, but it's doubtful just because of the sheer nature of them and the alienness. A lot of people believe they come from Cthulhu and that type of uh, setting. I don't know. That's a good question. No one really talks about the background a lot except for Kobold Press. And they're one that I gave to you in those sunken empires. They give you a pretty good snapshot. Everybody else pretty hands-off and pretty mystical about what they are. Um, they're called the Veiled Masters in uh, Pathfinder in the Inner Sea Campaign setting. And the Veiled Masters supposedly try to take over the Islanti, which were the Atlanteans of that age and era, the first raised human races. And they had a lot to do with the political machinations that go on, and they still do. And they get into the lakes and the waterways, and they make their ways into the human civil civilizations. In fact, they are believed to have caused the apocalypse on that world by destroying the Aslanti Empire by bringing down the what would be the Star Stone and uh, various other asteroids to hit the planet and cause a mass level event that killed off a lot of people and sent people into a dark age. So they're pretty nasty creatures. Just keep this in mind. Whether it's D&D or Pathfinder, they are very advanced. And as we know in both of the settings, uh, whether it's the D&D system or the Pathfinder system, the reptiloids were the ones that took and, and colonized the worlds at first. So the snake people, the Yonti, um, their predecessors, the serpent folk, they were the ones that ruled the world. And then they devolved. And that's true of most of the settings. It kind of goes with the dinosaur setting. thing. So keep that in mind. And, and you might run into those down there. So serpent folk, not something you may have to worry about, but then again, you never know. So you ask then, okay, what kind of worship structure would you have under there if you include deities with these creatures? It's a very good thing. So we're going to hit the D&D &D ones first, then I'll pop over to the Pathfinder, and then you can choose, if you don't have one of those systems, which ones to incorporate and which ones not, or do your own. You know, that's, a lot of DMs do their own. Now, if the core deities of the... D&D side, you've got the above water ones like Bokob would make sense with magic, arcane, and foresight. Um, Arithmal, hate, malice, and envy, of course. You'd have that kind of things in those dark depths. Uh, Hextor, war, discord, and tyranny. Why not? Most of those races are warring with each other, and so the more evil ones and the chaotic and the neutral, chaotic neutral ones probably would go with him. Um, Obed High, nature, sure. Because you're going to still grow plant life under the sea and stuff. It's a little different than above the water. So ones like Obed High, um, uh, uh, Isis, Goddess Isis, could easily be put into those depths. Um, Weegis, yes, you guys all know Weegis. I don't even have to explain. Um, Beltar, now that's an interesting one that I saw that's a side deity that's mentioned. 
Beltar is the goddess of malice, um, caves and pits. Why that? Because a lot of chasms, caves, and pits in the depths of the ocean. So you could have that, and she very well could have worshippers there. Um, Dorisane, necromancy, demigod. Why not? Why couldn't you have undead water creatures? There are. There's a, there's the water ghouls. So um, remember that. <laughs> Yeah, we all know those. We run into those quite a few times. We've been in the water any time. Um, Incabulous, plagues, famine, and nightmare. Why not? Um, Chios. Oh, Chios is a nasty one. Um, a pain, deceit, and evil. Um, or actually, excuse me, creation and undead mastery. Um, Ayus. You can put Ayus down there. Why not? <laughs> Procan. Now, see, now we're getting into the water ones. Procan is the god of seas, sea lives, weather and navigation and salt water. So really Procan plays a huge part if you're using out of the core books of D&D 5e and 4. Um, uh, Skarosar, so that's the goddess of sadism, masochism, pain and pleasure. Why not? In those depths, <laughs> pretty dark things go on down there. Uh, Valkor, is the demigod of sailors and ships. So if you do have the surface dwellers, Valkor would have uh, Valkor would have some influence there. Zagi, humor and occult. Why not? Because down in those dark depths, they plumb a lot of knowledge, and you could. Um, uh, Istitia, water elementals, and in fact, wa evil water elementals. Istitia is it goes hand in hand with Umberly. You guys know Umberly. If you play D and D anytime. You know she's the bee queen of the depths. <laughs> so both of them are nasty, nasty. Um, deep Sechalis, the dolphin god. Uh, the Deep Sechalis is known as the dolphin prince and is of sea elves, oceans, and knowledge. And probably even merfolk and some of the other good ones. So don't don't lose sight of that. That could be used there as well. Um, <laughs> here we go. Blivdulipoop. You guys know Blibdulipoop, the Kuotoan god of depths, um, that corresponds real well with one of the nasties out of here. Who do you know out of the Cthulhu deities who would be close to Blibdulipoop? Dagon. <laughs> Dagon especially is worshipped by the Shahagan and many other nasties down there. Because Dagon, the scum, and, and all those, Dagon is a nasty of water, as is Cthulhu. Um, so you could do Dagon, Cthulhu. Either one works really well together in those depths. Adro. Adro is of the Lokatha and the Merfolk. And so that's the fish goddess. Um, Eldath is the goddess of singing water, more of streams and waterways and probably lakes, but could be ocean as well. Um, Poseidon, of course, without saying, Poseidon, the god of sea, would be out there. Uh, as would the sea mother. A lot of people worship the sea mother because she supposedly gave birth to all the things in the seas. So, if you're trying to do a D&D &D campaign, having these in there and the worship of these would make a lot of sense. You can find these on the D&D &D wiki sites. Um, the uh, SRD sites. So keep this in mind. You can find the builds and different things for these out there. Now I'm going to flip over and show you a little bit different because some of those are in Pathfinder, some are not. So you Pathfinder GMs are wanting to draw from Pathfinder, add these to your list. The Gilmen. Now the Gilmen are particularly um, part of the Inner Sea campaign. And you won't see them a lot in, say, Kobold Press and Midgard and some of the other places. You're not going to see them there. And why is that? Well, because they um, actually are supposedly the remnants of the Aslant civilization. When it, and, and you're going to see a lot of this in this new path that's coming out. Um, they're going to mention the Gilmen and women. And the Gilmen and women were what... The Aslanti evolved that didn't go underground, but went to the water. They evolved gills and became the Aslanti of the water. Now, you also have the Morlocks, which were the people and the races that when Starfall happened on that thing. The Morlocks were the other Aslanti, 
and other human races that went underground. As the drow and the Dwergar, of course, dwarves and elves. So you have a little bit of tie in there. The merfolk, again, part of things, the merfolk heavily populate the seas, and they can be good or evil. They, there is no saying they have to be good. Merfolk vary, just like gilmen vary. Now, many gilmen are the slaves and servants of the Abilene, or the Veiled Masters. And so they often are the foot soldiers for those type of creatures, per the, the things. Now, whether you use the campaign setting or not, you can use that setting in other settings, though Kobold Press does a good job, as does Purple Duck, of explaining a lot of their seas and how their patrons go. So I'm not going to hit a lot of those deities. I'm sorry, Kobold, I know. I should give you guys a little more love, and I will. Um, I have a Southland, so I will with some other ones. We'll do a deities and, and gods and goddess session with yours at some point in your differences. Um, the aquatic elves, very numerous. And so you have the sea elves that are in D&D. &D. The aquatic elves are a part of Pathfinder. Um, the the Caecilius also in Pathfinder. So again, your little tendentially merfolk. Um, Undine. Undine are very common. They are the um, elemental children of the water gins. Um, so the nymphs and, and along those sides. So that is their children that is a half-breed. And they are very uh, powerful in what they can do ability-wise. So a great race to play if you want to play a race or run as an NPC. The Aboliths, of course, are the Veiled Masters, depending on whether you use the campaign setting or not. The Adaro. The Adaro are shark humanoids. They have a humanoid upper half with shark teeth and a shark lower body. So the Adaro are nasty. They are mostly chaotic evil and neutral evil, meaner than snot, and they are not they don't play nice with all the other undersea races. They are a bully race. Um, the Charta. The Charta are small, four-foot kind of crustacean creature humanoids. They have a chitinous um, uh, outer body and armor. And you'll find them both in the underdark waters as well as in the regular oceans of the world. Uh, in, the, in the far depths. A very muscular, very powerful race. Um, the Ceratoioidae which are the deep trench fishermen. And they kind of look like um, the, the fish folk from Dagon and from Cthulhu. They have a the little, little light lantern thing that sits in front of them like a lantern fish in the depths. They look like that. And they're in the deepest trenches. So those are the ones that you find at the deepest, deepest depths civilization-wise. Uh, the Lokatha, which are the fishmen with the gills and fish women. Um, peaceful for the most part. But they're often taken prisoners by the scum and the um, the uh, uh, la, 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 scrags and the uh, Grindylow. They tend to take them. And Grindylow are also part of Pathfinder. The Shahagan, pretty much universal with every system. The Nixies and the Nymphs. So you have a lot of variety. You had a couple more races with Pathfinder. And you can easily convert those to 5 and 4E if you want to have that variety. Uh, so keep that in mind. Now, sea gods and goddesses for Pathfinder, and there are quite a few, and I, I will go through some of those. Um, the ones that are known and kind of the oldest, um, Gozra is considered the oldest and the kind of the father of the deities. I'm going to get down my inner sea gods so I don't make a fool out of myself in going through these. Um, so this book right here. So Gozra is known for the weather as well as the oceans. And Gozra is kind of an interesting dichotomy, if you've ever seen it. Um, it is both. Gozra is both man and woman. So a very hermaphrodite type of creature, a god or goddess, depending. The storms are seen as the male. The sea is seen as the female. So when the storms hit, it is Gozra the male. And it's Gozra, the mother female, on the other ones. So Gozra has some interesting things when it comes to the ocean. Um, Lamashtu, of course, the mother of, of all creatures. Let me show you Lamashtu. She is a nasty little piece of work on the demon side. And um, actually, is she demon or devil? Yep, demon. So she is a nasty. She's the mother of all monsters. Uh, Nethys, god of magic, easily could be down at the bottoms. Norgorber, 
and Norgorber is seen either as the assassin, the poisoner, or the secret keeper. So Father Skinsaw, um, a lot of different ones there. Uh, Zan Kuthan. Zan Kuthan would be worshipped down in the depths. He is the god of pain and of self-mutilation and other nasty things. Kind of almost like a, a Cenobite <laughs> from the old uh, Hellraiser, like that. Kind of like that. Um, Phrasma. Phrasma is life and death. So Phrasma absolutely would be in the bottom. Rovagug, the destroyer, of course. Rovagug is trying to destroy the world, so Rovagug would be pretty much everywhere. Um, and then our, our lovely, <laughs> oh gosh, Urgothoa. you got to love Urgothoa, the undead goddess of pleasure and undeath. She might be down there as well. So keep in mind, those are the ones that would be down there. Now, who else could you see? Um, Alceta could be at the bottom because she's portals and doors. Besmara, of course. Pirate Queen and Mother of the Oceans. She's chaotic, neutral, chaos, trickery, war, weather. She is a fickle goddess, and she is absolutely a, an ocean goddess. So keep that in mind. You will find her down there. Grotius, uh, end times and empty places, of course, would be down there. Hanspur, the water rat. Um, you know, they, you'll find them a lot in the rivers and the more lake and Carthian area of the inner sea, but could be there as well. Um, let's see. Uh, Ziphus, of course, the grim harvestman you could find down there. Um, Nadiri, the lost maiden, drowning, of course. And she would come about for people who have lost someone to drowning or, or a nasty event like that. So keep that in mind. Um, the Outer Gods. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll show you a few of those. And they would absolutely be there. Um, I'm looking to see. You might see Yulral, which is the uh, wise goddess of the elves at the bottom depths, too, because of the aquatic elves. So keep that in mind. Those are the ones that I think majority-wise you're going to find. Now, of course, there's other Pathians for Pathfinder system, depending on what you're using. So you could find others. Now, these are pretty universal, honestly, no matter what campaign you're in. These, of course, are the Elder Mythos, <laughs> which is Cthulhu. All right. So Abhoth, of course, disease, fecundity, and ooze, as oozes, of course. Um... Azothoth, yes. Entropy, madness, and mind destruction. Of course you'd find them down there. Bokrug, yes. Bokrug especially. Down there among those races at the bottom, so like the scum and the, the deep ones and the merf and some of the corrupted merfolks and the abolets. Absolutely Bokrug would be of that. It's revenge storms and water. So very nasty, um, but chaotic neutral. It's kind of funny. Not necessarily evil, just destructive. Um, Cthulhu, which is Cataclysms, Dreams, and Stars, of course. Any place you have a major cataclysm, he's going to be. Um, Mordigian, which is Darkness, Ghouls, and the Undead, of course. Um, Mahar, or Mar, Caverns, Mountains, and Volcanoes, of course, down in those areas. Ogresh is uh, Subterranean Waterway, so Ogresh would absolutely be in there. In fact, Ogresh is seen almost like an elemental. Let me show you and see if they show an Ogresh picture. Ah, uh, nope, that's just the open mouth. So, um, Natharlatep, of course. Uh, Natharlatep is the dangerous secrets and forbidden magic. Um, Yig, with the serpents, would be down there. Uh, Sathuga, or Sathagwa, uh, ma magic outcasts in the underworld, of course. And then Yog sahoth and that's gate, space, and time. So all those nasties can be in there, and I'll show you a couple of them. Um, there is Abhoth right there, his aspect. Um, they don't show Bokrug, the giant lizard. Uh, uh oh, Aster. I don't like Aster. Um, there we go. Getanathoa, um, disasters and lost islands, right in here. That's Haster down there, by the way. They're in the yellow robes. Nasty, nasty. 
Um, there is Mahar right there. Ah, Mordigian is there. Um, there's Natharva top, the black one right here. And uh, there's Tathaga right there, and there's Yig right over here on this side, on this. So you can have a lot of nasty, nasty critters that come along. And if you need to, if you want some more information, you can either get it at Chiasium, which Chiasium has a lot of that, or Strange Aeons does a great job in their Gazetteer, the end of them, and you can get that by getting that series as well for the Pathfinder side of things. So keep in mind, there's a lot you can do, but you got to put in the structure of worship because there is worship under those waters um, and the cycles and what goes on and the type of creatures. Now, how do they interact with each other? They have different alliances. A lot of the more chaotic, neutral, and evil races are going to try to align with each other. But remember, it's about dominance of that sea grounds and the food and everything else. So they're not going to want to give way. So scum don't necessarily get along with Shahagan. In fact, Shahagan often enslaves scum, or vice versa. Um, the, the same with the uh, uh, the Grindy Lows. The Grindy Lows often are, are um, enslaved by either the Ceratoidi, the uh, Caecilius, or the Gilmen, or even sometimes the Shahagan. So you're not always going to have, you're, you're a Daro are going to slave everybody else. They're, they're about that. And think of it like the Underdark, where you have the different races that brings on slavery and things like that. That goes on all the time under the waters. They're not always food. Now, the Lokatha are often the food or the, the mating breeding things where they can do half-breeds and other things. They tend to be the most common and the most nice of the undersea that are kind of neutral or good as are the aquatic elves and some of the merfolk and the undines and the, um, the gillmen, some of the gillmen are. Everyone else is all for themselves. So keep in mind there's going to be a lot of this under the waters. And there's going to be kingdoms. And most of them are going to be water city-states with the surrounding area being in control because of the armies or the mass amounts of patrolling groups that are in those areas. So keep that in mind as you look at those types. Again, a little longer video, but I think this topic needs a little bit. And otherwise, I think we're really going to leave a lot to be desired if we don't take a little more into the structure of this type of setting. And so I'm going to post these up here. I hope they help some of you who are getting campaigns together. I hope to run some myself. I think this is an area that you will surprise your players, and they're not going to be used to playing it or being a part of and and really it adds an element of surprise to your game. Now if you're not playing D&D or Pathfinder, can you do the same things for like a futuristic thing? Yes, you can. A lot of these things can be advanced creatures. They can have star weapons, lasers, um, sonic weapons, other types of things, be advanced, have airlocks, have their cities being a lot more welcoming for upper air breathing races and have the type of vehicles and vessels that can go into those depths and not be destroyed. So yes, you can do it for a more modern campaign. Can you do it for a steampunk setting? Of course you can. You can do some pretty dark steampunk settings where you have an apocalyptic world where the only place that there really is some things is at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, no, we're not going to paint right now. Put it on the table, please. I know you do. <laughs> Boy, you got to love Mini-G. So I hope this helps. Um, took a little bit of lunch to do it. If you got questions, let me know. I mean, there's a lot of ideas I have for the underwater type of campaigns. Um, and honestly, keeping it to 30 minutes is tough to do because there's just so much you can do with it. But I just want to lay you some groundwork so it will help you out when you're developing these things to get your ideas and thoughts together. And you don't have to search 50 places of what do I put down here. So now you know. All right. Thanks. Have a great week.